Welcome to Chef Marketing Academy. This lecture is on how to make a great presentation. That does not mean PowerPoint presentations, please. It primarily talks about some people, both in the corporate world and in the academic world, are always great presenters. You feel good about what they communicated, how they communicated. I wanted to make this video lecture because I find people have asked me again and again what makes a great presentation and immediately my thought goes back to two sets of people who make great presentations. Some of the best memorable teachers are great presenters. You remember them all the way from high school days to college days, the professors, some professors you remember all the time. You may not even remember their name probably, but you will remember their lecture. And the same thing is true about preachers. You find somebody like Billy Graham, always in command of when they make a presentation and doesn't matter the audience. Audience could be just one-on-one -on -one conversation a small group or in a large convention hall with 5,000, 10,000 people, they always seem to be enormously influential and impactful in whatever they say. So I began to analyze this thing. And I must tell you, my journey began in the 70s when I asked College of Education the question, what makes a great teacher? We had in the business school about 100 doctoral students teaching uh, courses to undergraduates, about 60 faculty members, and some of them were excellent presenters, excellent teachers, others were average, and a few were really poor. And I thought if there was some way to train them or give them some learning about what makes a great teacher would be very helpful. And what I found surprising to me was that there was a scientific research done and the great presenters have three qualities which will be sort of a packaged into my lecture. One, they are very enthusiastic about whatever they communicate. They have a passion. Second E is that they have an empathy. They relate to the audience, they relate to the context, and they're able to go up and down. They can communicate to almost like a third grader student, or they can communicate to a PhD, or a prime minister, or a president of a nation. That ability of contextualizing came out very quickly. Empathy, listening, understanding the audience, their perspective. And of course, third one is that they are experts. Unfortunately, both in the corporate world and definitely in the academic world, we have overemphasized the expertise side and not as much about the passion, enthusiasm, or about the empathy or the listening skills. So this is about presentations as a speaker. It does not mean, as I said, PowerPoint presentation. It means just in general, how do you communicate and how do you influence the audience? So, as I mentioned, the question to ponder for us is that what makes somebody a great teacher, very memorable, or a great preacher? I find that there are twin requirements of great presentation. One is what to say, what you say, and the other one is how you say it. It's that simple. I mean, I can complicate by adding a third dimension, a fourth dimension, but the marginal contribution by the third and the fourth dimension will be rapidly declining. Ultimately, these are the two dimensions that I find more fascinating. So if you look at the chart, the great presentation is equally good about what you say and how you say it. A boring presentation would be one what you say is very, very interesting, intellectually great, 
But the way you say it, people go to sleep. The audience goes to sleep. It's boring. Don't have the charisma of speaking or making a presentation. On the other hand, we have quite a lot of these possibilities where there would be professors in the classroom, there will be corporate communication managers, executives trying to communicate to their own employees or public speakers where they will have jokes after jokes, but there's nothing substantive behind what they say. So it looks like almost, and this is a stereotype, Chinese food. You feel good when you eat it, but you are hungry again in two, three hours. So that's why I call it glitzy presentation. They always have a lot of slides and videos, but when you analyze the content, you feel like something was missing. You loved it. Very similar to stand-up comedians, for example. And by the way, the same thing goes with stand-up comedians. They may be very good about jokes, but unless they have a meaning in life, what you say is as interesting and important as how you saw it makes a difference. So if you take the great comedies, situation comedies, like I Love Lucy, or Everybody Loves Raymond, you know, these are the old time programs. I've analyzed those and I come out with the same two things. They are both not only funny in the way they say it, but what they say, there's a meaning. People relate to that. It's like a daily incidence for them. And of course, if you neither have the substance nor the style, it is a poor communication, poor presenters. It's the form and function in design. It's the same idea, essentially. So what I have done is to analyze this, do a lot of research, and find out whether what you say is a unidimensional phenomenon or is it a multidimensional phenomenon. And I find that what you say has five separate dimensions. And we'll go through that journey in the first half of this lecture to talk about what you say, if you can organize around these five principles, you will be very effective in what you say. And we'll follow the same thing in the second half of the lecture about how you say it. The five dimensions are framing the issue, non-providing a non-intuitive perspective, having a conceptual elegance, tremendous amount of rigorous approach in your uh, evidence or your facts and figures. And ultimately, it creates an aha factor. I didn't know that thing. It's interesting. Food for my thought. Those kinds of reactions audience is going through mentally. So let's go into each one of them. Framing the issue. And I'll take examples mostly that come from the marketplace. Uh, maybe even more marketing, but these are more common examples. The first is obviously a question, do the poor pay more? Interestingly, there's a lot of literature whether the poor people in the society end up paying higher prices for buying very premium brand names. What's the reason for that? Is it because they are not informed properly? Is it because the manufacturer and the retailer take advantage of them? Or is it something else? Why do poor pay more? I think it's a very important question. So we need to analyze that. That immediately grabs the attention of the audience because it is framing the issue around which you want to talk about. Second example is, and this is a perennial question, are great salesmen or salespersons born or can be trained? This is the age-old debate, nurture versus nature, for example. And of course, the whole literature in psychology, in human behavior has gone back and forth. And the obvious answer is that it is both. It's not just either or, but part nurture, part nature. Same thing, part, you have the aptitude to sell. You love to do it. And at the same time, you get a training and a way of selling it, such as product knowledge, for example, or the way you make presentation, but you love to do it, interestingly. So first major thing is framing the issue. Second one is a non-intuitive or a counterintuitive perspective. For example, in the competitive strategy literature, 
we have a very good framework, probably one of the most elegant frameworks created called Five Forces of Competition. Michael Porter analyzed sources of competition and came out with a framework of mutually exclusive and exhaustive and that framework is very enduring. But more interesting thing would be a question to raise more intense the competition whether it comes from rivalry among existing competitors or new entrants coming into the industry or a substitute technology buyers having power to compete against you buyers becoming competitors or suppliers doing the downstreaming activity and become your competitors i find very fascinating up to a certain level of intense competition is fine, but beyond that one, you are actually learning to cooperate. So, as the competition grows, cooperation comes down, but after a certain level, as the competition intensifies even more, cooperation goes back again. So, we learn how to cooperate with our suppliers, we learn how to cooperate with our customers, which is a very mainstream partnering phenomenon. We sometimes end up doing strategic alliances with new entrants or with substitute technology providers in pharma that has been very common between the pharmaceutical as opposed to the, for example, biogenetics. So that's an interesting non-intuitive perspective. One would expect that there is a negative correlation as the competition increases in an industry, cooperation must come down. But we find actually it is a U-shaped curve. Second thing, same thing, there is a lot of empirical evidence that both lower income and upper income consumers prefer premium brands. It is only the middle class families who go for uh, store brands, private labels, non-store but private brands for example, generic brands actually, doesn't matter which product category, but the lower income people end up buying more premium brands and higher income people end up buying also more premium brands. That's very fascinating again, so it's a non-intuitive perspective. It immediately grabs the attention of the audience and therefore you can now communicate more in a more effective way. Or the third one is conceptual elegance. Some of the most complex phenomena are ultimately theorized into very simple propositions or very simple uh, construct as we call it in the academic world, for example. And I have chosen pretty much three to show you. One is the theory called cognitive dissonance. It basically says that when your behavior and your beliefs are not in sync, then what happens? The answer is that you rationalize your belief systems to match with your behavior. Which says that in marketing for example, it is more important to reinforce the decision after a customer has made a choice of your brand or your product. Simple idea, we have used that in marketing. But this cognitive dissonance theory is equally used for example in dissonance that arises after making a lifelong commitment, let's say in engagement. What happens toward attractiveness of the other person after the engagement? Does it go up? Does it go down? What happens? Interestingly. But it is also used surprisingly when widely held beliefs such as faith-based beliefs are questioned. Actually there is a book out called When Prophecy Fails and in a small town in Illinois, very faith oriented Christian community, some of these experimenters went and said, based upon the old scriptures, there is a doomsday. Doomsday will happen at this time based on our calculations. But more importantly, this community is the one that God has somehow blessed to survive and will procreate the next uh, evolution of humans. Interesting. The community believed that thing. They built the underground shelters because we had the era of nuclear, you know, bomb and the atom bomb and all the stuff. So they began to build shelters. Every all of these forecasts come midnight. 
There was a clock, clock is ticking midnight, everybody is anxiously waiting. 12 o'clock midnight comes, nothing happens. There is no big bang, for example, nothing happens. So now there is a dissonance between your widely held belief and the actual behavior or experience. What happened is interesting. You begin to now disbelieve by saying clock must be wrong. We must have done wrong calculation. Very interesting to watch, but ultimately you have to reconcile with your experience. And that's a great, great experiment, field experiment done by the founder of this theory in psychology called Leon Festinger and some of his students. There's a similar, very simple theory called perceived risk. Perceived risk is a behavioral phenomenon to our risk as opposed to economic or financial phenomenon. And this one was Raymond Bauer at Harvard University in the business school. He was a psychologist. And he came out by saying that we have complicated the life by understanding the psychology of customers in a too complicated way, like multi-attribute theories, but there's a very simple framework, namely that the buying behavior, brand preference is all anchored to the risk. The greater the risk, greater the word of mouth communication about that product. If a product is more risky, I'll become more brand loyal. And he began to actually influence the discipline in a way that was strictly, I mean, it's so obvious, but nobody put it together like that. These are two great theories it's very similar to Einstein's equation. Ultimately, he could summarize the whole universe into one equation, E equals mc square. Similarly, in marketing, we talk about customers, but we never analyze that there are three roles of a customer. In marketing, we have mostly looked upon customer as a buyer, because that's the how literature came about. But customer is also a user, and a customer is a payer also. In B2B market, business to business, it is very obvious because there are three different departments involved. But in family household, while we know this is true, we don't think from that viewpoint. Children may be the users, husband may be the buyer, and the wife may be the chief budget officer, she manages the budget, for example. Very common in an American family. So are there situations where the buyer is also a user and a payer. In that case, we have three roles within the same individual. Or when the user is not a payer and a buyer, as it is true in uh, free services or into, let's say, medical, you know, health services, where we have an insurance, where I'm the user but not a payer, for example. Many government services, I'm the user but not a buyer or a payer. And that's a very framework that one could talk about as one more. So conceptual elegance is very key. Next one, of course, has to do with a rigorous approach. In other words, these are great stories, good theory, but somehow, since the rise of the era of reason, we don't believe in strictly faith-based or experience-based belief systems. We want it to be scientifically documented. This is the consequence of uh, industrial revolution, inventions, etc. So we have to provide an evidence. So it is a fact-based evidence or evidence-based opinion or a theory. And there are three approaches one can take. One, of course, is a standard experimental design where you rule out alternatives very common in agriculture, or very common in consumer behavior now, very common in psychology. Or one can take analytic models, very common in economics, where you take econometric data, nation's data, demographic data, and you do a time series analysis, or you do simultaneous equations. And today, of course, analytics is a major, major industry, almost about to cross $100 billion, it looks like, where we have all this data collected on a real time, uh, either from the end consumers, like in most of the service industries, like telephone, banking, etc., or intermediaries like retailers. We have a Nielsen audit, IRI audit, all that comes in, and now I can build analytics, all kinds of analytics, mathematical models to show that I have a hypothesis and that hypothesis I am validating, for example. Customer lifetime value. First of all, is there a customer lifetime value? 
and is it really profitable for the company? And you can come out with a non-intuitive finding, but it is backed up by data. Not all customers are going to be profitable customers. So that's the kind of a thing I'm talking about. And the last one around here is that what you say should have an aha factor. In other words, uh, somehow it is non-intuitive. It, it challenges your prevailing wisdom, such as, for example, we have always believed that more satisfied the customer, more loyal he or she will be. But the data clearly shows you even satisfied customer defect. That gives you a different perspective. Or I have done a lot of research myself to say, if you take all consumption differences, we can link it to cultural differences, but all cultural differences are themselves climatic differences. And we haven't studied that right because we have looked at east-west as far above the equator, as far below the equator with the colonial expansion and the industrialization of the world in the last 200 years. But if you take the north-south axis, you can clearly see differences in geography between the northern climate versus the southern climate. For example, northern European behavior for same necessities, food, shelter, and clothing is very different than the southern Europeans, not because of cultural differences, but because climatically the resources that you need to survive are just not available in the same way. Northern Europeans have to depend on animal primarily. There is no vegetation. So if you want to make clothing, the only place you can go is leather or wool. There is no cotton grown. Same thing food, you have to rely more on animal-based uh, calorie, protein, fat, three ingredients you need in the body. As you go toward the Mediterranean climate, on the other hand, we have fruits and vegetables. And the diet, therefore, is, has a more variety in the process. In fact, my research has shown, if you take the cheese content, Northern European will have 40% cheese content. As you go further south, it drops to 2 percent like in feta cheese in Greece or mozzarella cheese in Italy, for example. And as you come closer to equator, the concept of cheese drops from all cultures. And it is switched over to olive oil, coconut oil. We need saturated fat in the body, but it does not come from animal source. Or in Mexico, it is the avocado, for example. It's conclusive evidence. It is there. You can't deny it. So the best aha is something which was always there, but nobody saw it that way. Or the best aha comes when you connect the two dots. They were there, but you connected the two dots. For example, a great theory was six degree of connections. Interesting. In other words, a Columbia University scientist was able to show that if you go six iterations, you will find anybody who is a stranger somehow connected to you. Now, with the age of the internet, people have done research and say the six degrees actually is dropped down to two or three degrees. You can find anybody by two iterations. You ask someone who asks someone and then you find the person. And with the database, I may not have to ask anybody. There may be zero degrees of freedom. Interesting concept. It immediately says, aha. So you actually pay attention to the presentation. Similarly, there are five dimensions of how you say it. And those five dimensions are, as its chart shows you, passion, which I pointed out earlier, empathy, confidence, and I'll talk about that a little more, storytelling, and what I call sandwiching or bookends, however you want to call it. So let's go over each one of them. Passion. Enthusiasm is very contagious. If you are passionate about what you say, audience gets passionate. It's interesting, which is what the preachers are all about. I mean, I love to watch them either on television or listen them on uh, radio Sunday mornings. That's my favorite pastime. And you simply glue on to them because they have a passion to communicate which is interesting. So enthusiasm is contagious. As I mentioned, great teachers and great preachers are very passionate about the subject matter that they are communicating. 
You have seen the same thing with political leaders, social activists in general, big movements that we have think about like the civil rights movement in America, Nelson Mandela movement in South Africa, Mahatma Gandhi movement in India, they are so transformative. Or even the Arab Spring right now that we are experiencing in the Middle East, or the transformation that is taking place from many of the autocracies to democracies, as it happened when monarchy collapsed in Europe, for example, where monarchy was replaced by democratic uh, governments, essentially. Fascinating social activist, political activist, NGOs as we call them, non-government organizations, they have a passion which comes from purpose. Something more than just making livelihood drives these people. So the great teachers are not concerned about their paycheck, but they are concerned about making a difference. That's the passion and purpose that goes with it. Second dimension, as I mentioned, is empathy. Contextualize it and make it relevant. And this is where I find you take great Bible preachers and you find what was written in the biblical days, any religion, doesn't matter with Hinduism or Buddhism or Judaism or Christianity or even Islam, it's the same thing. You find fascinating, the preachers are able to connect to your daily living now. And hence you saw one of the best-selling books right after Bible is Rick Warren, who is a pastor, a preacher, evangelical person, and apparently his book has sold 30, 40 million copies, what is called Purpose Driven Life. It makes meaning out of the same basic belief systems to our contemporary life. We are all searching for meaning, we are all trying to survive, we all have a midlife crisis every day nowadays, given our lifestyle and everything, so empathy, make it relevant to the audience and I must tell you, it is just a joy to see top scientists teaching freshman undergraduate classes in physics, math, literature, or in marketing. It is incredible to see how much they make a difference and impact on the lives of the fresh minds by and large. Third area is confidence. I have learned over the years myself, in my younger early days, as I would walk up to the podium after being introduced, my heart will pound. I'll be nervous. And then I realized that if I am nervous, the audience loves my anxiety and wants to eat me alive. So I learned. I began to relax before I go up, no matter what situation. And I began to really take a deep breath, lower my blood uh, heart rate, go up with confidence. And therefore I like this saying, I may be mistaken, but I'm never wrong. That gives you the confidence, you see. And of course, there's no some such thing as a right or wrong. That's a logic, Western philosophy thinking. Multiple perspectives will say both are right. It's like the five blind men touching the elephant, right? If you touch the leg of the elephant, you think it's a tree trunk. If you touch the nose of the elephant, you think it's a snake. If you touch the tail, you think it's a rope. Who is right or wrong? Everybody is right. So the new logic is pluralism and therefore you take a perspective and you are communicating from your viewpoint. That does not mean somebody else's viewpoint is wrong. They have their alternate viewpoints. And this is the debate, the Socrates approach of learning essentially or making presentations. Next area, of course, is storytelling, and probably this is the best style. I find that the great presenters are always storytellers. And I find great movies are excellent storytelling movies. The total incident or the encounter may be very small, but the way the producer and the director actually create storytelling phenomenon, they become everlasting. For example, uh, the king in, in the British economy 
who had a stuttering problem, did not want to become the king, he's forced into that situation. That's a very small, simple episode, but the drama and the way it is done, you get absolutely engrossed into that story. And there are so many classic movies. In fact, the best classic movie that lasts for a long period of time, always our storytelling. A Wizard of Oz never, never becomes old. Still one of the most popular movies after, I don't know, 50 years, 60 years, whatever it is by and large. And the second aspect of storytelling is that it's a very conversational, informal style. You may be dressed formally as I am, but am I approachable? Can you reach and touch me? If you can get that feeling that I am just like you, I can communicate at the same level in an informal way, in a conversational way, rather than in a lecture mode, it seems to do very well. So storytelling is one more dimension of how you say it. And the last one is sandwiching. We say, like every public speaking expert will tell you, Dale Carnegie, you know, Toastmaster will train you how to make public speeches. It's the same thing. Open it, say something of what you're going to say, say it what you say, and then end by saying what you said. It's always the rule of three. Everything in life I find rule of three ultimately. So, and every broadcaster will do the same thing, those into stories, you know, pretty much. They give you a little teaser, pretty much grab the attention, give the story and conclude it back again. So there's a bookend, a starting and an ending in which you provide content by and large. So opening and closing the presentation is very key. Provocative opening and closing is even better. So I started with the question, what makes somebody a great teacher or a preacher? That's interesting. We know there are differences. We know some teachers make enormous influence on the lives of the students. Some preachers do the same thing. So the issue around it is that why some are able to do it and others are not. And now I will close it with a similar story. It is called the last lecture. This was a Carnegie Mellon professor who had an incurable cancer, I think cancer of the pancreas. There was no way out. He was passionate about what he was teaching. I think it was a computer science or information science course, whatever he was teaching. And he began to reveal his own personal frailty. He's human just like anybody else. And began to share his lifetime journey toward the end. And he did something that is absolutely incredible when you watch the video. He talked about his last lecture. I have seen my students cry when they watch that video. It has influenced them in a way that goes beyond a lecture. Very provocative, very personal and very much a conversational lecture. That's what one needs to do. Start with a provocative opening, end with a provocative opening, in between provide the content and the style of delivering what you say, how you say are the two dimensions. So let me conclude this lecture. Making a great presentation requires excellence in what you say as well as in how you say it. What you have to say has five dimensions as we talked about. Framing the issue, frame the issue right. I mean to me immediately in my mind when you say framing is uh, the camera person. Have you seen they frame it? They always look at around the whole thing, the window, which says ignore everything else and just focus on that spot. They are very fussy about that, right? That's the framing. Framing means delimiting to the focal point that you are talking about. Framing the issue, a providing a non-intuitive perspective, a conceptual elegance, rigorous approach and creating an aha factor. The rigorous approach, I am ambivalent myself. I do believe that you don't have to have a scientific validity to make a difference, but unfortunately 
the world is organized with an analytic mind. Numbers do matter to people. So very often in my lectures, I gather numbers and throw numbers. And people, wow, this is interesting. And that gets the attention. So I think numbers do matter. And therefore, to that extent, although historically philosophers never had numbers, religious leaders had never had numbers, they talked about life in general, more spirituality without numbers, and they are as compelling presenters as scientific people are today. But in today's era, numbers do matter, a scientific approach does matter to create a validity. How you say also has five dimensions, passion, empathy, confidence, which is a key one in my mind, storytelling, another key one, and sandwiching or bookending the whole thing. Final point, great presenters are great learners. In one of my books with my colleague Andrew Sobel, we have tried to analyze what made somebody a great advisor, a trusted advisor, like Aristotle, for example, great advisors to kings in the old days, uh, great uh, lawyers were advisors you know, to monarchy in the days of democracy. We had a great bankers as great advisors. So we try to analyze and we have in one of the chapters when the student is ready, the teacher will show up. That means these great presenters are constantly learning. It is just like a software 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, etc. These are many, many dots. They're constantly iterating, revising, revising. They're constantly watching the audience reaction, perfecting their message on both what they say and how they say it. So great presenters are great learners. And my view is that if you don't have the capacity to learn from anything, anybody, then you are not likely to be a great presenter. And the second way, equally important, is best way to learn is to teach. And I must tell you that I've, I've had the biggest satisfaction I had was when I have motivated in in-company programs for transformation uh, in, in a company. Uh, we have made sure that the senior most leaders come and be teachers. Not as much to communicate by command and control. I'm the boss and I'll tell you, but more to internalize the same message. So if you're going to communicate your strategy for the future, be a teacher. Best way to learn is to teach. This was a great, great practice that was put together at the Crotonville General Electric Internal Executive Education Program or their own internal MBA program. And nowadays I find it's absolutely a must. So same thing is true as a professor, uh, the best way to learn is to teach. And that means you simply say, I want to learn something new. So you have the passion of learning, which is the first point I'm making. And then secondly, you do several iterations, offer the course again and again, different audiences, etc. And you begin to come out with a perfection. In fact, when you watch some of the best public speakers in management, you just find absolutely incredible. They're like preachers. They're absolutely excellent content and a very smooth, style of delivery in a positive way, very passionate delivery. And at the end, after 45 minutes or an hour of presentation, they get a standing ovation. I would not give the names. There are so many out there who simply have a command of the audience and a command of the uh, listeners or people who have come to pay mega bucks to listen to these people, just like we do with evangelical preachers, for example. I hope this has been a useful presentation. Thank you very much.